Hello everyone, uh, this is Xiao Ping uh, from XP Education. Uh, thanks again for subscribing to our YouTube channel. Now today, uh, I'm going to go through uh, the solo swan model. Now again, I want to recap is that we went through the Keynesian 45, which is based on the short run model. The ADAS model is based on this medium run model. And of course, the solo swan is of course on the long run model. Now, uh, probably aware, uh, we're wearing one of our new uniforms. Hope you like it. So I have the XP Education at the back. So again, um, from now on, we're probably wearing something like that to present to you guys. So I apologize uh, for not looking professionally with the suit. So how exactly uh, do we characterize with the solo swan model? Now, first of all, we have to use what we call the Cobb Douglas uh, production function. Yeah. So y is equal to uh, ak alpha l uh, one minus alpha. Yeah. So we say that the output is equal to a, which is some sort of a technological factor. K is for capital. L is for labor resource, alpha is the proportion of the allocation of the income towards the capital, and of course 1 minus alpha is going to be the proportion of income that is being allocated to labor. Okay? Now, when we say Cobb Douglas, yes? Now Cobb Douglas is a very special term that we use to correspond what we call the constant uh, return to scale. Yes? Now what exactly does it mean by this constant return? return to scale. Now constant return to scale goes like this. If I double my input, my output will also be doubled. Yeah? So how exactly do we correspond this? <coughs> so output is equal to a function of capital and labor, isn't it? Yes. Now which means that if I want to increase my input by a factor of, for example, uh, alpha and alpha, yes? So if I increase the alpha by alpha, then of course, you will also increase my output by the same factor, yeah? So this is what we call the constant return to scale, okay? Now, well, apart from that, what else do we have? We have the decreasing return to scale, yeah? So what does it mean by decreasing return to scale? If I double my input, uh, my output will be less than double, yeah? So repeat, uh, if I double my input, my output will be less than double, yes? Now, what about increasing return to scale? Well, increasing return to scale means that if I want to double my input, my output will be uh, more than double, yes? So these are what we call the different scales uh, in terms of the production function. Now, just to make things a lot more clearer, by looking at the power coefficients, uh, it will tell us exactly uh, whether this production function exhibits a CRS, a DRS, or IRS. So for example, if I say, um, <clears throat> we'll give you a production function which looks like this, okay? So y is equal to ak uh, 0 0.2 and l 0 0.8, yes? Now the idea is that if the power adds up to be equal to 1, then it is what we call the constant return to scale, yes? Now what happened? If I change the 0 0.2 and make this 0 0.1 instead. Now 0 0.1 plus 0 0.8 is going to be less than 1, isn't it? Yes? Then this will be our DRS, yes? Decreasing return to scale. And finally, if I change the 0 0.1 to something like 0 0.4, then 0 0.4 plus 0 0.8 will be 1.2, then this is going to be an increasing return to scale, yes? So an easier way is pretty much just look at the power on top of these equations and this will tell us whether it exhibits the constant return to scale, decreasing return to scale, or increasing return to scale, okay? Now, in terms of the solo swan model, now, we like to work with the capital per worker or output per worker, yeah? Now the idea is very simple. If I just say Y, yes? Big Y means the level of output, yes? The level of output just means, well, it's a GDP, yes? But it doesn't give you uh, a meaningful interpretation in terms of uh, what is the quality of living, for example, uh, in terms of the, uh, the population. So in economics, we like to work with the output per worker, yes? So this is the level of GDP per amount of worker that is available in this economy, okay? So, how do I express this in terms of the output per worker model? So we have output over y 
and everything towards the right hand side is also divided by L, yes? Now, please note, big Y divided by big L will give me small y. Now, small y is the output per worker, yes? Now, on the right hand side, we have AK alpha, L1 minus alpha. Now, because L is on the denominator, so we'll minus 1 to represent that. So, the 1 take away the 1 will cancel each other out, so we have AK alpha, 1 minus alpha, yes? And finally, we have AK over L to the power of alpha, yes? Now, what's K on L? It is capital per worker, yes? We can express that in terms of Y is equal to A, K, alpha, yes? So we have the output per worker is equal to the level of technological progress times by the capital per worker to the power of alpha. And this is often known as the, uh, the production uh, function in terms of the little k, okay? So please be reminded that Having a big K means the level of capital, yes? And having a small K is what we call the capital per worker, okay? So, now, I'm going to walk you guys in terms of the solo swan model, yes? Now, how exactly uh, do we correspond this solo swan model? So, here we go. Again, with every single model, uh, you always have to draw uh, a beautiful diagram. So, we have the little y, which is the output per worker, and then we have the little k, which is the capital per worker, yes? Now, how does the production function look like? It's going to be a concave nature, yes? Now, let's have a think. Why is a production function has to be concave? It's because of this diminishing marginal product of capital. Now, write this down. The idea is that as we accumulate more and more capital, yes, this marginal increase in terms of the output is becoming smaller <coughs> and smaller and smaller, yes? So, this is the production function, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So, the next part is what we call the, the savings curve, yes? So, S is equal to theta y, okay? Now, what is theta? Theta is the savings rate, okay? So, savings rate, okay? And then we have the capital replacement investment curve. So, it is the replacement investment curve that is equal to N plus delta times by K, yeah? So, N, it is the population growth rate plus delta, which is the depreciation rate times by capital per worker, okay? Now, whenever we have the intersection between the savings versus the replacement investment curve, this point here will correspond towards our steady state level of capital per worker, and then take a line up, and this will correspond this to the steady state output per worker, yes? So, how exactly do we use this model to talk about the transition of the economy? Uh, now, obviously, once we are actually in the steady state, yes? there will be zero growth, okay? So I repeat, once we're actually in the steady state, there will be absolutely no growth, okay? Now, have a think. Imagine an economy is somewhere here. Call this K1, okay? Now, at K1, I want you guys to take a lot up, yes? Now, have a look. At the current level of capital per worker, this means that the amount of savings is a lot more higher than the replacement investment curve, yes? Now, what is the definition of the replacement investment curve? Now, you should write this down. The definition for the replacement investment curve is the amount of capital that is needed in order to retain the current level of capital per worker, yes? So, what this means is that at the current level of capital per worker, savings is a lot more higher in terms of the amount of capital that is needed to remain at the current level of capital. Now, this difference is what we call the net investment, yes? So, this is what we call the NI, which is the net investment. Now, how do we grow towards the steady state? Now, can you guys follow my fingers, yes? Have a look. The gap between the savings and replacement investment the further you are away from the steady state, the bigger is the gap, isn't it, yes? But as we converge towards the steady state, now can you see that? 
this gap is becoming smaller, smaller, and smaller, and eventually becomes nothing, yes, once we hit the steady state. So what does this mean? This means that as we converge towards a steady state level capital per worker, we are growing at a diminishing rate. Now write this down. The idea is about we are converging towards a steady state level capital per worker. So what this means is that as we get closer towards a steady state, we are growing at a diminishing rate. Okay? So, what about if we are at K2? Yeah? So what about K2? Now, if we are at K2, now can we see that <clears throat> at K2, the replacement investment curve is a lot more higher than the amount of savings, isn't it? This means that we have insufficient funding that is available to retain or remain the current level of capital per worker, isn't it? So, which will result in what we call a negative net investment, yes? It will result in a negative net investment. So, obviously, we will converge back towards the steady state level of capital per worker and output per worker, yes? So, what this is trying to say is that once the economy actually engages or locks down to this steady state, now this means that there will be zero growth in the uh, capital per worker and the output per worker, yes? Now, the question comes down to how do we actually uh, sustain this uh, forever growth, yes? Now, some of you guys probably think that, well, why don't I just increase uh, the amount of savings that is available? Well, that's an excellent solution, right? Because having a high saving, have a look. As I increase the saving upwards, now can we see that? <clears throat> the new steady state will be here, which corresponds to K star 1, yes? So what this means is that at the level, current level of output or capital per worker, the savings is again higher than the replacing investment, yes? So we are converging towards this new steady state of capital per worker. But the question comes down to, what is the absolute maximum amount of savings you can actually save? Now, please be reminded, the maximum amount of savings you can save is 100% of your income, isn't it? Yes. Now, the argument goes like, well, technically, you can save more than 100% if you were to borrow money uh, and then to save. Now, that's not a clever idea, isn't it? Yes, because you'd be borrowing at a 10% and savings at a 2% and you are making a huge loss. So in this model, we assume that the maximum available amount of savings you can do is to save 100% of the income that you have, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that the best possible saving can shift up is when it's actually equal to the production curve, isn't it? Yes, because this part here is income, right? The maximum, the absolute maximum amount of savings you can do is when we hit this particular point, yes? Now, I'm sorry, but it's a bit too far, but this big dot here corresponds <coughs> to the K star 2, yes? It is the furthest possible steady state that you can achieve, yes? Now, this means that once we hit this particular point, then growth will be no more, isn't it, yes? So once we hit this particular point, then growth is no more, okay? Now, the question comes back to what actually will sustain in terms of uh, this growth uh, forever, yes? Now, if you guys refer back towards the curve Douglas production function, y is equal to ak alpha l 1 minus alpha, isn't it, yes? So, do you guys still remember this a? a is the level of technological progress, isn't it, yes? So, what this is trying to say is that the only factor that can achieve a sustainable growth is via an increase in terms of TFP, yes? Total factor productivity, okay? Now, this is what we call how do I engage in terms of total factor productivity is via this stimulation in terms of research and development, yes? So, how do we grow? So, the idea is that 
Let me rub this whole thing out and draw you guys a bit of diagram, yes? <coughs> so, okay. So again, we have the capital per worker on the x-axis and the output per worker on the vertical axis, yes? The Kerr-Douglas production function will be concave in nature, so this y is equal to a function of capital. And then we're going to have a savings, yes? So this is savings is equal to theta y. And then we're going to have the replacement investment curve, which is n plus delta times by k, okay? So this intersection point will correspond to the initial level of steady state, capital per worker, and then that will correspond to the initial state of output per worker, okay? So, the only thing that can actually increase in terms of the production function is where the production function shifts up, isn't it, yes? So which means that if I have a increasing A, yes? Now I want you guys to follow my hands, okay? So as A increases, the production function will also shift up as well, isn't it, yes? Now, assuming that theta is fixed, so the amount of savings rate is fixed. So both the production function and the savings rate will increase towards that direction. Now, can we all follow me, yes? Yeah? So both of them will be shifting higher, like that, yes? Now, given we have some sort of a replacement investment curve, now, can you guys all see that this intersection is forever moving towards the north and the east direction, yes? Now, this means what? As a steady state level of capital per worker is continuously moving towards the right, yes? It's like you're chasing this target, right? Because only if capital is less than a steady state is where you're going because the net investment is positive, yes? So, if this target is always moving, then we are essentially growing forever. And that is the only factor that can actually generate what we call a, uh, a continuation of growth, yes? Now, maybe for homework, uh, the idea is that what happens uh, if I suddenly have uh, the population growth rate uh, is equal to zero, yes? So what happens if the population growth rate is equal to zero and depreciation is equal to zero. Now, can you please maybe use a solar swan model to analyze how will the economy uh, transit in terms of from the current towards the new, if there is a steady state, yes? So maybe leave your comment uh, by visiting our website, xpeducation.com.au, look for inquiry, uh, or you can come visit us at level 11, uh, 530 Little Collins Street in Melbourne CBD, uh, whereby I can maybe work through the answers with you. But the idea is that I want you to have a think. What happens if population growth rate and depreciation rate is equal to zero? How will you use the solar swan model to analyze its impact? Okay, so that's enough for today. Um, please like, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, perhaps leave a comment on the bottom. Uh, but obviously, I want to discuss this question in my next video. And obviously, the more like, the more views I have, then obviously I have more incentive to upload more videos for you guys. So, hope you guys enjoyed the video. And thanks again for supporting XP Education. I hope you like my new t-shirt. Well, next, maybe next time I should probably wear a black one. Uh, the white one kind of making it look big, big. But the idea is that uh, from now on, try to wear the XP uniforms to present these videos. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. And see you guys later. Bye-bye.